Welcome pals to a new video. Today, I wanted to cover pixel art styles, particularly uh, the kinds of things you should be thinking about when choosing a style for your game and the challenges that you might come up against as you're trying to realize that style. So let's not waste any time and get straight into it. All right, pixel art styles and how to choose one for your game. The first thing I wanted to show you is just a big map of a bunch of games uh, that have pixel art style that I think is, is pretty good. <laughs> and I just want to talk about them basically. So here are a bunch of games that I think are representative of pixel art. Mostly these are indie games and they're quite modern. Uh, some of them on the very, very far left are retro for the purpose of uh, having the conversation. Now, these kinds of aesthetics uh, were originally technical limitations of the hardware that the games were running on. Uh, and as that hardware improved, we were able to represent games with more colors uh, until we basically could just do whatever we wanted. So we have names for these 1-bit, 8-bit, 16-bit for like Atari, uh, NES, maybe SNES uh, level of, of fidelity. Um, and modern games that chase these styles usually try to maintain some kind of relation to those limitations, whether it's just in the palette or in the resolution as well. Further down, I have more stylistic games, and I have two kinds of directions for this stylism. So bottom left, we have games that are uh, minimal. They're specifically chasing a, a look and feel that's not based on those technical limitations, but has some sort of evocation of them. So limited palettes would be a good one, uh, and very constrained forms, things like silhouettes for characters and um, just the way those characters are rendered. Uh, being much, much more unique and constrained. That's what I would call like a minimal style. And on the other side, we have basically no restrictions, not even restrictions to 2D. So games like The Last Night and Octopath Traveler uh, are, I would say, you know, so uh, futuristic in the way that they're made that they might not even be pixel art to some people. Um, of course, pixel art is still involved, but the use of things like post-processing uh, 3D lighting, 3D models, those things make a big difference. I think the way that I like to break this down really comes down to your objectives as a developer and what you're looking to use pixel art to achieve in your game. Pixel art has definitely grown in the last 10 years from something that was done to faithfully recreate or extend classic retro style games into a kind of brand of visual, I guess, language on its own that evokes something that is more handmade and indie. So let me show you how I kind of interpret these. So we have along the top, this idea of like the pixel purity line. Games along this line are that more traditional style of pixel art, where as we move from left to right, we're increasing fidelity, but we're still treating pixels as pixels. As we move down into that modern space, we have more non-historic constraints or techniques that are used to enhance the pixel art or push it into a space that's more original. So here on the left, we've got fewer colors and fewer details by definition, just because that's the constraint. Moving into this limited space here, this more stylized space, we still have those constraints, but we're pushing them in different directions, making uh, considerations to things like form, not because we have to, but because we want to. And that usually creates a more strong identity because it's more novel. On the right side, down the bottom, again, we're using technology to push pixel art into spaces it's never been seen before by adding and augmenting uh, other technologies in with it. And on the far right, this is just your, your core pixel art, right? More colors, more detail, but still, yeah, still keeping in with the, uh, with the pixel art aesthetic. And of course, this is not an exhaustive list. Uh, it's not even close to breaking down categorically every kind of thing you can do with pixel art. At the end of the day, pixels are just things that appear on the screen. They're just lights. So you can do a lot with this. But I think this kind of captures the general thrust of where pixel art is at the moment as, a, uh, as an art style, as a medium, as a, as a movement. So let's now break down these domains, give them names, and start talking about the challenges associated with them. So as we push games into different directions visually, there appear challenges 
that we have to face to kind of maintain uh, something that feels cohesive and strong and like it has its own identity, depending on the direction we push it in. So I've given these names hesitantly. They're not really official names. They're just names that I've given them for the purposes of my analysis in this conversation. Uh, the names are retro, max bit, as opposed to high bit. High bit kind of covers all of this, uh, but max bit is the idea of yeah pushing it as far as you can go while still uh, being faithful. Minimalist and post bit, which is yeah throwing the kitchen sink at the screen, uh, including pixel art. So given this, there are kinds of challenges that appear based on these directions, based on these approaches. The furthest left retro has creative challenges, right? Because you have less to work with, you're put in a position where creating a strong identity for your game and just creating imagery for your game is more difficult. Characters have less that they can use to stand out and there's less space for subtlety, right? Because you just don't have the granularity to do what you need to do. The minimalist space has more of a disciplinary challenge. So you're not really bound by the constraints of a small resolution or a completely limited palette, but you have to still impose constraints on yourself uh, and maintain them across the use of the game for that style to actually pay off, right? So there's self-imposed constraints. Then we have technical. So as we push higher and higher fidelity of pixel art, the way that you actually pull that off is totally dependent on your technique as an artist. So being able to actually render something that looks beautiful and is consistent and to do that in a high volume across the entirety of a game is difficult, right? It's a technical challenge. And then we have technological. So it's a subtle difference between technique and technology, but effectively the difference is honing you and your hand versus honing your use of a multitude of tools in a way that's harmonious, right? You've got your chromatic aberration and your lighting and you've got depth of field blur. How do you make those feel consistent in an art style? So I just want to fanboy a little bit about some games and how they deal with these challenges before we go into my sort of like critical analysis of the, of the way that you approach the challenges. Of course, I think Shovel Knight is an excellent example of a game that manages to find a really strong identity that's still really retro. It's, it's clearly, um, taking inspiration from games like DuckTales and Mega Man, but it manages to push the forms of the characters and the way color is used uh, in such a way that it just creates its own identity and it's so uh, recognizable and unmistakable. In the retro space, a common technique here is outlining to actually define these elements. You can see in Undertale as well, heavy use of outlining to actually create um, a separation between the characters and the scene. This is a very common technique and it works well if you use a lot of black in your game. But uh, games, as we sort of move into a more modern, uh, more high fidelity space like Momodora, try to use more just compositional elements to create that distinction, right? Because we have more colors to work with, we can do things like just create a slightly darker background with less contrast in order to create the distinction. This is still a challenge, of course, and it's more down to the artist's ability to compose that image, but there's more space here to explore. Further down, as we sort of go into this more minimal look, we can see that uh, we're still in a lot of these games trying to adhere to the idea of a palette. What tends to happen here is the use of negative space and selective palettes comes into play. So we can see in Blasphemous, the entire environment is basically this like washed out sort of like grayish brown and the two characters on screen are way, way brighter, much, much more saturated. It's not that the palette is necessarily limited. You know, there aren't just like 16 colors in this picture and any different environment you go into might have lots of different colors such that the overall game has like a quite broad palette, but in an individual frame, the expression of that palette is very limited and very distinct. There's a lot of contrast here between the foreground and the background just with the use of color. Even Jump King, uh, which I would say is a pretty messy game visually, maintains a really strong sense of uh, contrast by doing the same thing, right? We've got a very kind of like verdant green washed out palette. There's green everywhere, but through the use of saturation and just selective color, 
we can see exactly who the character is and where they are. And we can see where all the platforms are. We know with quite a lot of confidence uh, what we can stand on and what we can't. Shape here helps as well, square shapes versus organic shapes. Moving on to something like sword and sorcery. Uh, this is what I think is, is like mega stylized. Like it doesn't get much more stylized than this. You can see there's lots of pixels here. This is like a very dense screen. It's probably like 960 by 640 or something like that. So there are a lot of pixels, but the details are very selective and very repetitive. The shapes here that we see, there are square shapes, there are round shapes, and, uh, and we have our character shapes, which are these very thin stick figures uh, with very, uh, very square heads. This is something that's not really based on any constraint. It's a, totally just a choice. Uh, but the commitment to that choice is what uh, is what builds the frame and makes this game look so unique. I want to note specifically like the way that these edges here, these square components, are repeated over here. There are challenges with this as well, of course, like creating frames that are too washed out. Now we can move over to games like uh, Dead Cells, Fez, Celeste and Hyperlight Drifter. Uh, and I would probably even lump in uh, Kingdom and Eastward in this space, where these games have a lot of respect and faith to the retro um, in terms of the resolution, but their commitment to creating their own color palette and their own visual style kind of trumps that. And at times they dip into more modern tech in order to solve technical challenges and just create more of an identity. So in the case of Eastward, we can see this kind of like, it's almost like a scan effect or like a, it's like a shader over the screen that creates a little bit of that chromatic aberration. And the palette in general is just kind of washed out. It makes the game feel very classic, right? It feels very like chill because of uh, those effects. There are also procedural lighting effects throughout the game as well. Again, a game like Kingdom, we can see this procedural water and the lighting helps the game uh, get that real feel to it. It's got a day-night cycle that's procedural as well. So the fact that the game, you know, becomes brighter and darker depending on the time of day it is and the colors change so drastically can only really be done by employing procedural means. You couldn't really do this with straight pixel art. Dead Cells famously has a 3D character that's being sampled down into something that looks more like pixel art. Uh, this is kind of like a time-saving measure in order to keep the pixel art aesthetic but reduce the amount of time committed to animation. Fez, a massive, <laughs> massive example here of like a game that is totally uh, pixel art until it's not. It's a completely 3D game that rotates around its axis. Uh, I like the way that this game manages to create, for the most part, a really flat style. Like the the there's almost, I would imagine, purposefully a commitment against trying to create depth in the pixel art because the depth comes through in the camera movement. I think that's a real stroke of genius and uh, I don't know if it gets enough credit really. Celeste would be another example. So th this item here being the item that we definitely want to pick up, it's more noticeable because it's brighter, right? Lighting is being used to draw our attention. And I think, you know, using um, procedural effects in this way that a lot of these games do. It's very tasteful and uh, totally acceptable in, in 2021. Maybe some pixel art purists may have uh, had an issue with it in, in years gone by, but definitely not anymore. We, we're in a spot now where there are so many games that having them be good games and look visually unique is something that we want. I wanna quickly dip up to this line of games here before we go to the bottom right. Uh, this is Frogato and Friends, Iconoclasts, Chasm and Owlboy. I think of these games as really core pixel art games. They rarely, if ever, use any procedural effects. They have very detailed, very beautiful pixel art. They're artisanal in the way they've been created because you can just see the amount of painstaking effort that's gone into creating these frames. These games are very difficult to make. They have a lot of 
it's kind of like very high risk, high reward in terms of like the amount of investment of time, but also the fact that, you know, games like this can struggle uh, in the sense that, like I would say here in, in Owl Boy's case, uh, because there's no constraints on the colors, on the forms, on the amount of detail, there are frames that can get quite noisy, right? Some of these details conflict with each other. Uh, and that's a challenge that comes with taking on such like a massive palette and uh, a massive scope. And then finally in the bottom right, we've got the full, full on caution to the wind post-bit games. So uh, this is, I think, Songs of Conquest. It, you could see it's actually a 3D scene with billboarded pixel art. The lighting and the bloom is, is super gorgeous on this and I love it. The resolution on the pixel art is not, it's not that high. Like most of this is quite low res, um, but the frame itself is obviously really nice and high res. You can see procedural shadows. There's tons of, of procedural stuff in here. And the challenge with games like this is, again, managing all of that and creating a style that still feels clean and deliberate. So Octopath, here's another one, a massive vignette over the screen, very dark on the edges, and a really, really powerful depth of field blur to make this feel like a tilt shift scene. Uh, I personally would love to explore making a game that looks kind of like this in the future. Uh, this is kind of like low poly 3D with pixel art textures. The Last Night is a giant game as far as its impact on the pixel art scene, I think, uh, especially for games. You can see like, this is clearly a pixel art game. Like the assets are all pixel art, but the scene itself has so much 3D tech in it. In my opinion, like this is a beautiful example of a game that balances these things well, but you could see very easily how, you know, we're almost at the point where we're asking the question, like, does this need to be pixel art at this point? Like, is the thing that makes this worth looking at, does that have anything to do with the pixels? <laughs> because, you know, this lighting is so masterfully created, you know, that the actual frame, the way we, we uh, have our eye drawn around it and just the tech in general, like there's like so many things going on. We've got the depth of field, we've got uh, good shafts of light that look like volumetric. Uh, we've got bloom coming off of these lights, lots and lots of reflections on the water. What is this like subsurface scattering? <laughs> I don't know. It's pretty, pretty nuts. Uh, really, really interesting. So that's kind of like what the scene looks like these days. Uh, I want to talk about how to deal with some of the challenges that games across this spectrum here uh, come up against. So let's check that out. So the way I like to think about these challenges is in something that's called, well, I just made this up. Uh, creative boxes. So it's kind of like when we talk about thinking outside the box versus inside the box. Uh, in this little section, I want to talk about defining the boxes in the first place and how these different kinds of games, the retro, minimal, uh, max bit and post bit games, how they actually define the boxes differently and the challenges that come up out of those. So uh, we have the little boxes and the big boxes, and those are based on constraints. The little boxes are more constrained, big boxes are less constrained. So in the retro space, we have breaking out. Okay. If you have a game that has a bunch of constraints from the beginning, limited resolution, limited palette, maybe you're not even trying to break the technical limitations. So as far as like the amount of things on screen and how things appear on screen as Shovel Knight would, then all of your efforts are going to come down to breaking out of those constraints, right? Giving your game an identity that's clear and distinct and that works while pushing against those limitations, those boxes. On the minimalist side, rather than actually setting a bunch of constraints based on historic hardware limitations, you actually start with no constraints and you're trying to create them yourself, right? So the style is defined as the way that you've shrunk those uh, sides of the box down into a smaller space. And this is the swords and sorcery approach. On the big boxes side, we have a big box that you're trying to fill. This would be something like Owl Boy, right? Where we have very few constraints. We have as many colors as we want. We have a, as high of a resolution as we want. Uh, but our task is to try to fill that 
into something that feels cohesive, that's not overly detailed or not overburdened, um, and you know doesn't get lost in all of that size. It also takes a lot longer to do because it's more painstaking and difficult to just produce that much pixel art. On the post bit side, it's very easy to fill a frame. It's very easy to, to throw stuff at the screen and to populate it with color and light, but then the challenge becomes containing within the box. So let's take those four examples I just gave. We take Shovel Knight, Owl Boy, Swords and Sorcery, and uh, The Last Knight, and we'll talk about how they actually approach uh, those challenges and where they come up against them. So Shovel Knight is in that breakout uh, zone where we start with a lot of constraints and we're trying to create an image from that. The challenges here are in creating readable and diverse forms to maximize the palette use artfully rather than just arbitrarily and to maintain a sense of scene. Shovel Knight does that really well here. We can see the, uh, the character standing out against the background. We can see the context that the background is in, like we know where we are and what this place is. We can make out the other characters as distinct from uh, King Knight here. And overall, the, the image is fairly well composed, even though there's a very limited palette uh, and very few pixels. Now we can see that's achieved uh, with the character design, yeah, primarily. So King Knight here, you know, is a lot of contrast in the colors being used. As far as like the black shape in the helmet and the outline versus the very bright gold colors, the same can be said for Shovel Knight. And even these characters, despite having a lot of similarities, are very distinct. These blues and the horns on the helmet very clearly from a silhouette, even if you were to make these characters completely black, you could still tell the difference between them. This is done with uh, exaggeration for the most part, right? These characters are not anatomically correct. Uh, they are stylized in a way that maximizes the things that we use to differentiate them. So in this case, the heads are really important because the helmets are really important. Those are the distinct elements. And so those are what are um, more caricatured. And you can see the game does a pretty good job with those outlines and with those strong silhouettes of still managing to create scenes that are very colorful uh, without breaking the readability. In the minimal space with games like Sword and Sorcery, the struggle comes from establishing a unique, limited visual language. So that's up to the developer to do that. Committing to solutions within those constraints, right? Not breaking them. And then doing that in a way that doesn't wash out the frame. So let's look at the constraints here that Sword and Sorcery puts itself under. One is the fact that unlike Shovel Knight, almost all of the characters look uh, essentially the same from a silhouette perspective. They all have very thin long legs. All of their heads are simple squares. They have very little that they can use to differentiate between the characters by design. That's a constraint that helps make the game look unique, but it's also a challenge. And we can see that bearing out here uh, with some of these scenes, it's really hard to pick out the different characters, where they are relative to the scene, and who is who. It's almost hard to even notice the characters, especially this character in the scene. They're almost completely hidden if you didn't know what to look for. Sword and Sorcery manages some of its uh, UX constraints by breaking pixel art a little bit. So we can see these like uh, just like drawn lines on the screen. Uh, and there are other areas where there's like a bubble over the character. I can understand why trying to solve these with pixel art would have made it quite difficult. Uh, and so, yeah, that's definitely the challenge. It does a good job in some areas where uh, Sword and Sorcery manages to separate the character from the background. So in this case, you know, the black legs and the head really nicely create more contrast between that washed out um, hut behind and definitely are visually separate from the forest in the background. So when building your levels, trying to actually establish some sort of visual separation and composition in the frame that allows the character to stand out is really important, especially in games that are very minimal and stylized this way, right? You can see how easy it is in a game like Shovel Knight to do that much, much harder if all the colors are as flat as they are 
in sword and sorcery. I mean, look at this. It's like the whole palette, like <laughs> the entire screen fits inside of like 5% of the color spectrum. Now let's take a look at the max bit example. This is uh, owl boy. So we're trying to fill the box here creatively. The challenges here are to achieve high consistent quality to meet resulting high scope and to avoid visual noise and maintain focus. So uh, the first is to just like have a lot of art talent. <laughs> and that's something that, uh, that the artist on Owlboy clearly has. Um, the second is to meet resulting high scope. So what tends to happen with these games is a high reliance on tile sets and reusing images. Now, the challenge is then with that repetition and with that high amount of detail, avoiding cluttering the scene. So there are some scenes where things are a little harder to differentiate. Um, having very clear layering and very clear hierarchy of detail in a scene is really important. This screen, I think, struggles a little bit just because of the way that the assets are layered. Uh, other scenes don't have that problem. Okay, so this screen is totally bespoke. You can see it's one big sprite. And as such, there's much more consideration into the composition. But this is very expensive to do time-wise. It's really hard to spend like, what, a week on every background in the game. And so the middle ground is, uh, yeah, where you use more negative space. So just not trying to take on so much detail in every frame helps this game really look a lot clearer and uh, and it really just helps the detail that's there stand out more. Owlboy has some phenomenal sprites uh, and some phenomenal tiles and I think it does its best when those two are working in harmony and not stepping on each other's toes. I want to also say just before we move on from Owlboy that from a technique perspective it tends to be the case that relying on really blanket techniques like outlining is something that artists in this space tend to try to avoid. You can see here there is some outlining on these characters, but it's what we would call sellout, so selective outlining, where the colors that make up the character are interspersed along that outline to try to soften it and break it up. We're really trying to chase with a lot of these games something that feels more painterly. And so achieving a sense of contrast without using obvious techniques, that's Oftentimes the goal, even if the contrast is still an issue, there's an objective there to make something that's still beautiful in every screenshot. And so it can be difficult. And then finally, with the post-bit games, we have the struggle to contain within the frame. Okay, so we're trying to balance here retro and modern techniques. We're trying to do that to build clear frames. And we want to do it in a way that feels purposeful. So I think The Last Night struggles in some cases the game's not out yet, I should say, but as far as the screenshots go, uh, it struggles in some cases to actually justify the pixel art and to build a frame that allows us to appreciate all of the time and energy that's been put into it. Here, I think the the spotlight is, you know, it's quite strong. There's a lot of that uh, smoke and lighting. There's a lot of rain. There's a lot going on here, and it's hard to to appreciate what's happening. The Last Night is a gorgeous game, and it's not really my argument here <laughs> that that uh, the culmination of all these techniques lead up to something that doesn't look good. But I think uh, the value of it being pixel art is something that, uh, I don't know, I, I wonder, like, if, if this was just high-res 2D imagery that was just, uh, you know, drawn by hand or vector art with all of these lighting effects, would we appreciate the fact that, that these were pixels or would that really change the way we experience the game? I don't know, but I guarantee you there are hundreds of games out there that have all of these effects and don't look even close <laughs> to uh, the way that The Last Night looks. This is uh, such a masterful combination of effects, even this like bokeh in the background for the, the lights. I mean, it's very difficult to capture all of that in a tasteful way. And you've essentially got to make a 3D game that looks really good as a 3D game and then incorporate the pixel art. Okay. So that's my interpretation of those four domains, the challenges they come up against and how they can actually try to uh, mitigate those challenges to create beautiful images. Let's, uh, let's do a little bit of wrapping up. 
So across the board here, we can see that the aims of any artist looking to establish an art style for their game using pixel art uh, will always be looking to primarily create a strong image, right? All of these challenges we've been talking about and the solutions to those challenges hinge on the idea that we're working towards something that reads clearly, that the players can understand, uh, and that has a distinct look. If you're trying to approach one of these art styles or some combination, your goals should always be to work within your means as an artist. What I mean by that is if you're looking to chase the visual aesthetic of something like Owlboy, you have to have a background in art, right? You have to know how to render an image and you have to have the experience and the workflow with pixel art to be able to bear that out over the course of an entire game's worth of art. Likewise, if you're working on something that's going to be mixing in 3D or using post-processing, it's worth appreciating how those interact with the pixel art and working with them in a way that's harmonious rather than just throwing them in. It's really difficult to create something that's very stylized. It's something that most artists uh, approach as they become more experienced because it's hard to find something that's valuable that hasn't been done before. And hopefully having watched this video, you'll be able to have the confidence to work towards a style uh, in a way that doesn't massively increase the time uh, and reaches something that actually adds value to your project. Thank you for watching, and I will catch you in the next one. Hey pal, thanks for watching, and thanks most especially to the patrons and Twitch subs who support this channel and my game dev project Insignia. To find out more, click the links in the description below. And uh, if you like this video, tell YouTube by clicking the like button, and then YouTube will tell me, and then I'll make more videos. That's nice. Thanks again, and uh, until next time.